this, they get swept up in the action. And instead of being able to step back from the action and analyze the larger playing field, they end up only seeing the people in the local surround, the people they're dancing with on the dance floor, or the people on the playing field in the middle of the athletic game. It's very difficult when the action is moving fast and furious and passionate and complex. It's very difficult to step back from the action and debrief and reflect on that action. In some ways, it's an obvious idea. The capacity to reflect in the midst of action is an ancient art and an ancient subject of practice. Every religious tradition, in fact, has a deep tradition of trying to amplify and strengthen people's capacity to reflect in the midst of action, because it's very difficult to do. So that even though this is an obvious idea, what I call, by metaphor, getting on the balcony, getting off the playing field, getting off the dance floor, that capacity to get off the floor and onto the balcony is very difficult. So the Jesuits would call it contemplation in action. The Buddhists would call it mindfulness. The Hindus would call it karma yoga. Every tradition has its own practices to try to help people reflect in the midst of action. Because when we're swept up in the action, we often can get ourselves danced into a corner or boxed off into a corner. Because we lose the capacity to ask critical diagnostic questions to locate ourselves and locate the relevant parties in larger art of change over time. We lose the capacity to think strategically and we're left with only our tactical smarts to keep us alive day to day. And that might work for some of us some, for some period of time, but eventually we'll get taken down. So the first, the first practice in the capacity to increase the odds of staying alive longer, they'll never stay alive forever. I mean, eventually they'll get you. If you're smart, you'll retire, like Jake. You know, before they get you. But it's uh, one way to increase your longevity is to is to practice the art of reflecting in the midst of action, of debriefing your actions. There are very few more useful practices than to be in the habit of debriefing routinely what happens to you day by day. And that capacity to step back on the balcony uh, is pretty essential. It's also almost impossible to do by yourself. So the second key idea is that you've got to have partners. Many people operate with the illusion that leadership is a, a craft of the lone warrior. That notion of heroic leadership as something that you do by yourself may be heroic, but it's also suicidal. It's a heroic form of suicide. But when you're dead, it won't matter a whole lot because you lose the opportunity to play in the next round. So one needs partners. Partners are absolutely essential, which is why I started by saying how important it is that you've got each other, those of you who stay in touch with one another, to call in the middle of the night and to say, give me a half hour or in the middle of the day, to say, what just happened in this meeting? I thought things were going smoothly. And then all of a sudden, so-and-so's eyes glazed over. What happened? You know, I don't really understand. And that capacity to call somebody who is disinterested, who has no direct conflicting stakes, who doesn't have any competing loyalties in the situation, and who can help you debrief what happened and come up with some new diagnostic possibilities so that the next day you can go back into action and take corrective action is absolutely critical. Leadership is an improvisational art. It's like playing jazz, not classical music. 
You may have a plan. You may have a strategy. But every plan is just today's best guess. Because you can't really predict what tomorrow or next week or two weeks from now will bring. Surprises are part of life. People are not linear systems. They can't be predicted in the same way that an engineered system generates predictability. And that capacity then to change the movements in the dance, to improvise, to requires the capacity to keep analyzing every day in a fresh way. Where are we at today? Where are we at today? Because this is different than yesterday. What surprises us? What didn't we anticipate? People who stick to the plan are in danger because holding true to the orienting values in a plan is absolutely critical. But holding true to the tactical and, and to some degree the strategic uh, orientation of the plan is a big mistake. One of our great generals who led the Allied invasion in World War II of Normandy coordinated an extraordinarily complex operation, General Dwight Eisenhower. It involved hundreds of thousands of people in secret, extremely complex operation. Eisenhower said, we never could have gotten onto the beaches of Normandy without a plan. And the moment we hit the beach, we had to discard the plan. That kind of improvisational flexibility, the ability to make a plan and then realize that once you begin in action, you're going to have to take mid-course correction moment to moment, which means one has to become alive diagnostically to seeking what's new in the situation that I didn't anticipate. That means one has to have the emotional courage to admit mistakes and to say, this was my guess, but the guess was wrong. And to be able to say to people, this is what we anticipated. This is what I even sold you to anticipate. But we've learned something since I gave you that sales pitch. And, and now, you, now you have to appreciate, and I have to help you appreciate what we've learned in the last weeks that require us to change course or to reinvest or to change the cost uh, ratio, uh, or to make different kinds of adjustments, or to include these other people in the equation that we haven't anticipated would be critical to the process. So we need partners who can pull us by the collar up to the balcony and help us reflect in the midst of action and ask that most critical question, who are we missing in this process? Because the people who are going to bring you down are most likely going to be opposition. It's not your allies who are going to bring you down, generally. It's people who have an opposing view. And why will they bring you down? They'll bring you down because they have the most to lose. Allies come relatively cheap. They have the least to lose. So they can join your perspective. The opposing parties, particularly the ones who oppose you most passionately, are opposing you because they're trying to hold on to something they consider precious. And therefore, your job is to understand your opposition even better than you understand your own allies. But that's contrary to human nature. We tend to hang out with our friends. We tend to join clubs with people like us. We tend to have Sunday dinners with our families and, and, and colleagues. We spend at least time with the people who are most obnoxious to us. And yet, if you want to stay alive longer in leadership, those are the people you need to spend more time with so that you come to understand intimately the nature of their perspectives, the nature of their loyalties, where they come from in their world, who is it that they're going to have to disappoint in their world if they were to go along with you even an inch down the road? So 
So you need two different kinds of partners. You need not only allies, but you need confidants. Sometimes people make the mistake of treating their allies as if they were confidants. And then they pour their heart out to their ally when they probably shouldn't. Because allies are useful because they also have their own constituency. They have their own cohort. Maybe your head of research and development and they're, and they're in the finance department and they agree with you on many kinds of initiatives. They believe in research, but they can't always share your perspectives. They have to also be loyal to their own people, their own, the people who look to them. So one needs confidants, people who are outside the system altogether, who will have no competing loyalties, who don't really care about the issues, but they really care about you. And so they can give you a more dispassionate assessment. Now, there are no confidants for all purposes. It's contextual. Many times we have our families, and we see them as our confidant, our husband or our wife, for example. But they, that person can't always be your confidant on all occasions. For example, when your sister-in-law comes to visit on the holiday and she decides to stay an extra week and you know you're going to go crazy if she stays, who do you talk to? Well, you can't tell. You can't, you can't pour your heart out to your husband and say how much you hate his sister or your wife and how much you hate her sister. You need somebody else to talk to because in that occasion, your husband or wife, they have a competing loyalty. You put them in a bind if you expect them to always be true to you because they also, they also have to respect their bond, that primary bond, to their own family. So even confidants are contextual. And some of you can, can then be confidants to one another on some issues, but on other issues you cannot be. And in a sense, you protect the relationship by appreciating, depending on the subject at hand, depending on the nature of the issue, whether that person has a competing state or not. One of the ways your confidants and your allies can help you is to help you depersonalize the conflict, to help you distinguish yourself and your role. Many times we can play who we are with the role that we play. This is quite common. We grow up, we're the son or the daughter of this person, and we think that's who we are. We become a doctor, a lawyer, a mayor, we think that's who we are. What happens then when we lose the role? What happens when it's time to retire? And we spent our whole life being this executive or that big shot. What happens? We all know that so many people shrivel up and die inside because they can't find another role. They can't find themselves because they have over-identified themselves with the role. And the preservation of the role becomes synonymous to survival. So the capacity to distinguish yourself from your role becomes a critical way of staying alive in your spirit as well as tactically. Tactically it's important because responding effectively to an attack becomes absolutely, in that regard, becomes essential. To view the attack as less personal than it feels. Attacks always feel personal. They look personal, they smell personal, they sound personal, but they're not personal. People attack you because they don't like what you represent to them in the role that you're playing in their lives. If you're gratifying them in the role that you're playing in their lives, they will be happy with you. 
If you're disappointing them in the role that you're playing in their lives, they will be unhappy with you. When Wang, as a judge, votes, decides, judges, King Solomonizes one direction, some people think she's great. Other people think she's awful. She can't win with all sides because she's not making everybody happy. She's disappointing frequently one side or the other. And if she were to take it personally, that animosity, those attacks, it would be very hard to keep going. The role of judge and the robes and the paraphernalia are all meant to help her remember that she's in a role. And it's the role that's disappointing. She's performing a role, but it's not the same as her because they don't even know her. They don't even really care about her. What they care about is what she does to them in her role. I once had, a couple of times, had lunch with the King of Jordan. He's a, you know, a very smart man, King Abdullah. And after lunch, one of them, one of those lunches was at the Kennedy School. Uh, we had a forum event, and one of the students, uh, a student from South America, raised his hand and he asked this young king this great question. He said, "You know, where we live, we don't have any kings. So I'm really dying to know." What's it like to be a king? <laughs> and King Abdullah was just great. I mean, he was so gracious, you know. He said, I didn't expect to be a king. My uncle was going to be a king. He was the crown prince. But just a month before my father, King, of, king Hussein, uh, died, he decided I should be the king. Well, maybe my father had been preparing me my whole life. Because he said to me, my son, over and over again, my son, the moment you begin to believe that you are a king, you're in trouble. King Hussein had become king when he was a teenage boy. He had been a king for many, many decades. And he knew that when people kissed his hand, they were not kissing him. They didn't know him. They were kissing King. And when people were shooting bullets at him, which they did on many occasions, they were not actually trying to kill him. They were trying to kill what he represented to them in his role as King. I had many conversations with Dalia Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin's daughter, who at one point was in the parliament in Israel. And then when her father was killed, she uh, resigned to build a center for peace, the Rabin Center in Tel Aviv. And I said to Dalia, I said, you know, it wasn't personal. And she said, I know. It had nothing really to do with him. It was all about the issue that he represented and the losses that his perspective represented to a significant constituency in our country. Of course, it's hard not to take it personally when your own father gets killed. And it's hard not to take it personally when the bullets are coming at you. So how to defend yourself effectively? When you take it personally, frequently your, defense, your defensive moves will be off base. Your defensive moves won't have the finesse the rhetorical clarity that they might if you were to appreciate the losses that you're representing to other people. And therefore, if you can frame the attack and redirect attention back to the nature of those losses that you're asking other people to sustain and the suffering that you're asking other people to sustain. So that leads me to the next key lesson in staying alive. Two childlike virtues. 
curiosity and compassion. It's very difficult to have compassion for your enemies. The word enemy itself has an ancient root. It comes from two parts, two words. En means not. And me has the same root as the word mama, or ama, or amor, or ami. Basically, enemy means not mama. And anybody who says mama ain't inside the circle is an enemy. That's the, that's the primitive psychology we bring to enemy. But in our day and age, where we live in worlds of interdependence, where it's impossible to wall yourself off from any constituency, the capacity to appreciate the opposing point of view and the losses that you're asking them to sustain requires curiosity and compassion. Because what look to you like trivial losses will not be trivial to them. I've known many wonderfully enthusiastic people with, filled with creative, new, reform ideas who walk into an organizational setting and are shocked to meet resistance. An engineer in Sony who comes up with the idea of the iPad, iPod way before Apple because he says, we can do this. We build hard drives for our laptops, for portability. We build portable music players that once played cassette tapes and now play CDs. All we have to do is put that hard drive in a little box, connect it to a, with a, a little jack, and we'll have the S-Pod. Isn't this a fabulous new profit center. And so this enthusiastic engineer waltzes into the office of the engineers managing the Walkman division and slowly feels the trap door open beneath his feet. And as he's going down the trap door, he's wondering, what happened? But he doesn't realize that he is saying to that engineer, who then has to say to hundreds and hundreds of his engineers, your designs are now obsolete. You marketing people who've learned how to market these, these portable CD players with, that are blue with these kinds of lights and silver with those kinds of lights and, and sealed for underwater and catering to the market in the Philippines and the market in Louisiana and the market in... You're going to have to start all over again. And by the way, the division that just bought Hollywood and bought all the music itself to become vertically integrated, now people aren't going to have to buy CDs at all. How do you like my great idea? So down he goes. Why does Apple build the iPod? They have nothing to lose. They have no investment in, in those markets. For them, it's all potential gain. It's easy to be adventuresome when there are no losses at stake. So the most fundamental principle in staying alive in leadership is to come to understand the nature of the losses you're asking people sustain. You may think, let's say you have an initiative to combat corruption. Very important to combat corruption in a clientelistic culture, in a culture, a patron-client culture, in which people depend on the big person for delivering goods, and where whole system is organized that way. Well, 
well, that system will work fine, but not very competitively in a global market, in a global world. So one has to begin to change some of that social contract. That means that you're going to take away the power of the go-to person. That means the go-to person is going to be able to distribute goods. For example, one of my former students with whom I spent a lot of time consulting in the last years was the Prime Minister of Greece. And George Papandreou um, came into office in 2009 discovering that his country was running a huge deficit that it had been, it had been hiding and lying about. And it was right at the beginning of the economic collapse around the world, if you remember. And when he exposed this deficit, he immediately was in trouble because interest rates were going to climb, which meant his capacity to service the debt was going to become untenable. I spent a lot of time in Athens during those years. And part of the problem was changing an economic culture of dependency, a clientelistic culture, in which all the way down in the fishing village, people looked to the big man in that node, ever escalating nodes all the way up to the capital. People looked to the, their own big man to distribute resources. And the system worked fine as long as the environment remained stable. But now, the government was going broke. So, what do you do? What happens to the big man? Let's imagine, just if we zoom in to the micro level, a young man, Dimitri, who graduates university, and he comes home to his village, and he goes and sits with his mother, who says, my son, it's time for you to go see your uncle. Because your uncle, he'll give you a job. Just like he gave your cousin a job and your brother a job. Because he's the big man in town. So Dimitri, you know, puts on a nice shirt. He walks up the hill to his uncle's house. His uncle greets him with open arms, invites him in, they sit and they drink uh, and eat. And after, after the meal, Dimitri makes his ask, his big question. Okay, uncle, I'm ready for work. What job do you have for me? And his uncle says, my nephew, you're a good boy. But haven't you been hearing about our situation? They've dried up all of my funds from Athens. Those people have taken away my resources. I have no job for you. Dimitri says, what do you mean you have no job for me? Uncle says, I have no job for you. Dimitri argues, but you gave a job to your to your own son. You gave a job to my to my other cousin. What's wrong with me? And the uncle tries to explain, there's nothing wrong with you. You're a good boy, but I have no job to give you. So Dimitri goes home. He's very upset. He complains to his mother. Now his mother has a choice at that moment. She could say to Dimitri, Dimitri, I told you to study hard in college. You should have come home prepared to start a new business. You could have created jobs here, not just depend on your uncle. Why didn't you prepare yourself better at university to become an entrepreneur and help us develop our village? Mother could say that, but that's not what she ever says. Mother gets angry. She says, just wait here, Dimitri. She puts on her, she changes her clothes, she walks up the hill, she knocks on her brother's door, and she yells at him. 
how can you do that to Dimitri? Why aren't you giving him a job? Uncle tries to explain. His sister doesn't understand. It's never been this way. She doesn't understand how this world's changed. She's doing her job. She's done her job her whole life in her world. She doesn't understand Deutsche Bank or European Central Bank or Goldman Sachs or AIG or any of these phenomena. She doesn't, she doesn't know what's going on. She just knows that Dimitri's a good boy and her brother's a bastard. And now a, now a, a rift has taken place in that family. In fact, villages all over Greece, rifts have opened up because the standard set of relationships has generated disloyalties as people were unable to deliver the expected goods. As the world changed around them, as the nature of the economy and economic relationships had to change, then the culture had to change, which meant relationships had to change, which also meant that uncle would no longer be a go-to guy in town. That's a big loss for uncle. He doesn't like losing his centrality. He walks through town being a person everybody respects. Now he walks through town. Some people still love him. A lot of, a lot of other people whisper behind his back. Well, he's not so powerful after all. Well, it's about time. He kept giving those people jobs, but not our children. These losses are real human losses. I can caricature them in a story. But when you're in Dimitri's family, when you're that mother, when you're that brother, the pain is very real. The adjustment to a new economic reality is extremely severe. And the losses then require leadership that can name with compassion so that people understand and can begin to apprehend this larger arc of change in which they have a role to play and in which their capacity to suffer those adjustments with grace and in which faith in their own ingenuity, in their own resourcefulness, their capacity to lean on one another, to buffer the pain while it takes time to start new enterprise. Leadership that can hold people through those changes over time require much more than analytical acumen. It requires heart. It requires the capacity not to two-dimensionalize this abstraction called corruption, and to understand that what you're really asking people to do is to disappoint a chain of loyalties all the way down to the peripheral village level. And though you must engage in that disappointment, compassion will enable you to develop a pacing, a sequencing, an explanation, a strategy of, of rhetoric, a strategy of narrative that holds people over time through those changes. Failing that, people will fight for their lives. And if it means taking you down, they will take you down. Because they're fighting for their families, for the world they understand as they understand it. Your job then, if you're going to lead them through the wilderness, change is to understand the nature of wilderness you're asking them to move through. So you're going to need partners because the natural human inclination is not to move towards your enemies. It's not to open your heart to their losses. It's to retreat and barricade yourself, callous yourself from them. So your partners have to help you develop the, the courage, the questioning, the curiosity to go have that lunch with that person 
that's the last person in the world you want to have lunch with. To go have coffee with that person who's the last person in the world you want to have lunch with or coffee with. So that you understand the nature of their world better. That diagnostic capacity requires your ongoing ability to get on the balcony and reflect on who are you missing. And ask the question, who is going to need to learn what if we're going to collectively make progress on this challenge? So from a tactical and strategic point of view, it's critically important to distinguish yourself from your role. So that you don't take it personally, and you stay, keep your eyes on the nature of the challenge itself that you're asking other people to sustain. But it's also important in your spirit, because there will come a time when you lose the job, and when you have to reinvent yourself, and find new ways to express who you are in the world, beyond the role that you play historically. And maintaining that flexibility, that plasticity, to reinvent yourself, to go back to some of that childhood imagination that we, many of us had as teenagers when there were so many different jobs that might have been interesting. That capacity to go back to that plasticity, to find new vehicles to make meaning in life. Is also essential. Fourth, staying alive requires listening. Most people die with their mouths open. <laughs> <coughs> Most people in positions of authority spend too much time talking and not enough time listening. So they never really find out what's going on in the opposing faction. They don't create a very sophisticated stakeholder map, a constituency map, and do the required homework to understand what's at stake for the various constituencies. So they get the pacing and the sequencing and the framing off. So it's essential to listen. That's why curiosity and compassion become so essential, because that's what you do when you're listening, is you ask a lot of questions. You let yourself be dumb. You let yourself be naive. People will say to you, well, you're, surely you understand. You're the, you're the minister. You're the CEO. You're the director of the agency. You're the, you're the grandson of the X family or Y, one of the 20 families. Surely you must know. And you feel like it's shameful for you to ask naive questions. You're supposed to act like you know. But the fact is you don't know. There's so much we can't possibly know about the worlds that other people inhabit and what's at stake for them. So the capacity to allow ourselves to even look naive, to look innocent, to be curious is essential because you won't uncover the data without that capacity, without that courage to be curious. The word naive has the same root as the word ingenuity and genius. Finally, I think we stay alive through all the changes by having a stomach for despair. I don't think you can lead without having a stomach for despair. There are going to be a lot of really hard times. Times that we even feel as suicidal as Robin Williams must have felt desperate times. Lee Kuan Yew described to me that in 1965, 
when he got kicked out of Malaysia. He had a lot of aspirations in Malaysia. He found himself walking on a beach. He was in despair. He had to pick himself up and start again and reinvent a new vision and discover a new form of pragmatism. Moses, when he accepted the task of bringing the Israelites out of slavery, he thought the hardest part of his job was gaining the trust of those slaves. He thought the second hardest part of his job was going to be to persuade Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the people go, thousands of his laborers. It turned out that wasn't the hardest part of his job. God helped him, gave him all sorts of magic tricks, a magic wand, magic powers, proving to the people that you can trust me. I'm more powerful than Pharaoh. Proving to Pharaoh that he was so powerful that even Pharaoh should be frightened. And so the people came. And Moses got to the promised land pretty quickly. He made a short detour at Mount Sinai, got the law, got to the promised land, according to the Bible, in about 12 to 18 months. It took about a year, a year and a half. He knew where he was going. He wasn't lost. These were ancient trade routes. Humanity had started leaving Africa to populate the rest of the world about 30, 40,000 years ago along, along those trade routes. So those trade routes had been around already by Moses' time 30,000 years. He knew just where he was going. And if he was lost, all he had, all he had to do was ask some of the desert tribal peoples, which way do I go? And they would say, well, you know, turn left when you hit the water, turn right. <laughs> Moses wasn't lost. He got to the promised land quickly. But when he got there, he sent scouts, one from each tribe, into the land. And he asked them, tell us what's in the land. Is it truly flowing with milk and honey? And so the scouts come back, and they say, yes, it is a fertile land flowing with milk and honey. However, there are cities with armies, and those armies look like giants, and we will look like grasshoppers in their eyes, because we are grasshoppers in our own eyes. So take us back to Egypt. And the people clamored for Moses. Take us back to Egypt. We would rather be secure in slavery than risk dying in that land. And at that moment, Moses and his brother Aaron went into their tent and fell on their face, depressed, despairing, crying. Falling on your face is a metaphor in Hebrew for despair and crime. The Bible doesn't say how long they stayed in their tent. We don't know if it took them a day to recover, a week to recover, a month to recover, or six months to recover. All we know is that they discovered at that moment that their work was not done. This was not a technical problem. This was an adaptive challenge. Of developing a whole new capacity of this slave-minded people to govern itself. To have faith in a law that was not given by a king. And that task was going to take another 38 and a half years. They weren't lost in the desert. They were in a training program. We call it development. You, if you're going to leave, need to have a stomach for despair. Need to have your eyes on the larger arc of change. In which you get to play your part, but you're not going to see the job done. You may not even get to go into the promised land. It 
may be that you will die on this side of the Jordan, but you will help people move along that arc of change if you keep your eyes on the work to be done. And finally, I think you stay alive by not buying into the myth of measurement. I think we all live in a world of measurement. And so we calibrate our worth in measurable terms. Now measurement is a profoundly useful tool. I started off as a doctor, and in medicine you save lives every day because you can measure blood chemistries, cardiac rhythm. But measurement is only a tool. There's a lot in life that cannot be measured. For example, you can't measure good. This came home to me a few years ago when my parents were visiting. My father was a great neurosurgeon in his lifetime. He's now 93. He invented many instruments that are used in neurosurgery. And he saved many thousands of people's lives directly and indirectly. But when he retired, he went back to a childhood hobby. He always loved gazing at the stars. So he decided he wanted to introduce his grandchildren to the heavens. So he went out and he bought all the astronomy books that he could find to give, to turn on his grandchildren to the, to the stars. But he didn't like any of those books. So he wrote his own. He sent it off to a publisher, Cambridge University Press, because they publish a lot of astronomy books. And they said, this is a good book. We're going to publish it. And they paired him up with a great illustrator from Holland, and they published it. Well, my parents were visiting on the Halloween holiday in the United States, in which children go out in costume, and they knock on doors to collect candy. My parents were visiting. And on that Halloween, we invited a young man to come to our house. He used to live in our house when he was a student. Now he was a school teacher. We invited him back home to go into the neighborhoods with our two children. And at the end of the evening, my parents were there. Rick, the young teacher, came back to the house. And I thought, I'm going to give Rick a copy of my father's new book. So I, I went to my study, bought a copy of the book, and I gave it to Rick. And Rick opened it up to the dedication page. He noticed that the book was dedicated to all the grandchildren, including my two children. Rick then closed the book. He turned to my father and asked my father if he could borrow a pen. My father, he puffed up a little bit. You don't get to be a neurosurgeon without a little pride. He reached into his pocket. He gave Rick a pen. And he expected Rick to ask him to sign the book. <coughs> That's not what Rick did. Rick got down on his knee, he opened the book to the dedication page, and he asked my two children to sign the book. They were little at the time. So in one inch scrawl, diagonally across the page, they signed their names. And as they signed their names, I looked over to my father, wondering, what's he feeling? And I noticed just the beginning of tears in his eyes. And I realized 40 years of saving lives could not be measured against the meaning of that moment. I don't believe any of us, when we die and visit with the angels, are going to be asked, how come you built three schools and not five? How come you saved 714 lives and not 816? How come you created 21 jobs and not 32? Why did you coach one basketball team and not two? How come you only stopped one war and not the three others? You can't measure good. And I think sometimes when we buy into the myth of measurement, we begin to calibrate our worth. So we think the next job has to be just as big and important. 
not realizing <coughs> that you could be pushing the wheelchair of a person as a volunteer in a hospital. And if you touch them in a gentle way and make their day a little better, if you volunteer in a school and help a dumb child learn how to read, and you see the lights turn on behind her eyes, you can't measure that. It says in my tradition, the Jewish tradition, which is also your tradition, you save one life, you save the world. I think we stay alive and move through the moments of despair by being able to celebrate the good that we do that's beyond measure. Not only feeling the burning flame of all the work yet to be done, not just punishing ourselves that there's more to do and we haven't finished, but also to be able to step back and rejoice and take pleasure in the fruits of our work. And that would be my prayer for all of you and all of the good and hard work you're doing in your society. And may you help each other rejoice in the fruits of your good work. May the force be with you.